All right. So I think we're going to try to finish this teaching up that we started about the gifts of the spirit. We started off and we were talking about first Corinthians 12 and also chapter 14. And the first in the first session or section, we talked about the difference. I focused on the difference between uh, praying in the spirit versus prophesying or specifically we were talking about tongues. So the gifts of the spirit, there's many gifts within these chapters, but I tended to focus on tongues because there was a specific angle that I felt like the Holy Spirit was wanting me to bring out. Before we get started, though, I, I, there are a few things that I, I want, I'm trying to the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me about having a proper idea about the context of what was going on in the Corinthian church. And what I mean by that is, what was the atmosphere that caused the Apostle Paul to be moved upon by the Holy Spirit to do the teaching about the gifts that he did in this letter? And I believe that there's internal evidence within the letter itself that can begin to open up our eyes so that we can see what was going on. So I'm just gonna go to the scripture real quick. And I'm going to, I think I used the King James version for some of these. And uh, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to prepare a context for you to understand so that we can better understand the instruction that the Apostle Paul was given. So in chapter 3, this is what he, he wrote. He said, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, oh, that's a little small, isn't it? Let me go ahead and pick that up a little bit for you. There we go. For you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you, Whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So the main thing that I wanted you to see is we're told by the Apostle Paul straight up that the people in the Corinthian church were carnal. That means that they were living fleshly. That means that they were not really being led by the spirit like we would expect because he also said he did call them brothers. Now I want to make that clear. He called them brothers. And I want you to understand, though, that he also says you come behind no man in any gift. So it's not that the gifts weren't flowing, but there's a big difference between gifts and fruit. And he's saying right here, he said it, that you're carnal. There's strife. There's division. You like Apollos. You like Cephas. You like this one. You know, listen, I, I really pray because I don't want to. I don't want to be in the flesh. Lord, help me. But, you know, we I find that the more spiritual we get quote unquote, the more spiritual we get, the more we oftentimes think we're right. You understand what I'm getting at? I think that true spirituality, though, when the Holy Spirit begins to really, really have his way in our heart and lives, what happens is there's a there is a crucifixion to the flesh where the word of God says that I'm to prefer my brother over myself. Where John the Baptist said the same spirit that was behind John the Baptist should be in our hearts too. Where I decrease so that he can increase. That when we come into the house of God, what we're here to do is this. We're here to exalt the name of Jesus. To lift on high. To yeah. give glory to the King of Kings yeah. and the Lord of Lords. It's really not about you, church. It's not about me, church. It's about him. And when we yield to him, he reveals his heart to us. And then he sends us outside to take that same love that he gave to us so that we can share it with other people. I remember I preached that a long time ago. It's really not about you at the church in Franklin. And some guy came up to me after he said, but I thought it was all about me, preacher. Well, yeah, it was all about you. If you were the only one on earth, he still would have died for you. Hallelujah. But at some time, he wants you to take the baba out of your mouth. Hallelujah. And he wants you to start using a fork so you can eat the meat of the word so that we can grow to maturity. So that he can begin to use us. Amen. Is that fair? Is that fair to say? Hallelujah. So it says right here that you're carnal. Now, I want to give you a little bit more evidence. So we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1, because I'm really just trying to show you the condition. All right, here we go. This is in the church now. 
Okay, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. This man sleeping with his stepmom is what it sounds like. And look what he says. And you, the church, are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, I have already judged as though I were present concerning him that had so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you are gathered together and my, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ deliver such a one to Satan. Why? For the destruction of the flesh. Why? So that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. I'm trying to give you a picture of what's going on here. Now you got to understand, this is a different time frame. You got to understand the city of Corinth, I've explained this before, had two ports. Sailors were the same back then as they are today. Now, I know I'm not going to get into that too deep, but they'd come into the ports and there, there was a temple in the, in the city of Corinth and it was a temple to a pagan God. And I've explained this before, but I'm going to explain it again. The way they had church in that temple was they'd go pay a prostitute, a temple prostitute, and they would have sex with the temple prostitute. Okay. As crazy as it sounds, they didn't have Christianity was just starting. The apostle Paul travailed the Mediterranean Sea to get over there to preach Jesus. Now this church is being built, but Christianity is a new thing. These pagan gods have been on the earth. Okay. And these people have been worshiping these pagan gods this away. And so you got to understand that the culture of this time is completely different than what you would expect. Like, in other words, some of us in here, we probably, all of us in here have fallen short of the glory of God. Right. But when we fall short of the glory of God, then we ought to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Right. We ought to not feel as though it's okay, especially when we have the word of God. Sometimes we might hide, we might run away from the conviction, right? And you got to understand the difference between the conviction and condemn, condemnation. Right. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to free you. But the word of the Lord will bring conviction to show you where something is wrong in your life. Amen. Okay. But this is the thing. When the conviction is working, then it reveals to us what's not right and what is wrong. And then we yield to the spirit of God. Look at this. The church is bragging about this. Okay. I'm trying to show you the condition of the church. We don't think of it this way. See, when the Lord first started moving in the church, I said something out of my mouth. And I don't even know if I knew even exactly what I was saying. But now it's becoming more and more clear. What I felt like the Lord said in my mouth was that uh, I don't want Corinth. I want the book of Acts. I want Pentecost. Because, see, the difference between Corinth, they were puffed up. They were puffed up. And the difference between Corinth and Pentecost is that it says on the day of Pentecost, they were all of one mind, yes. one accord. Yes. They were in the unity of the spirit. They had one thing on their mind, my friend, yes. to bring glory to Jesus. Yes. Yes. And listen, I made a point earlier. I feel as though sometimes when we start to move into the spiritual, being more spiritual, and the more we seek the Lord, if we're not careful, we can become prideful. We can become prideful in our spirituality. And we can begin to believe, like Brother Larson used to say, that we now are the handyman, God's handyman for the hour. God has called me. I'm the one that hears from the Lord. I'm the one that has the heart of God in this situation. If you're not lining up with what it is I believe, then you're wrong. I'm right because I know I hear from the Lord and there's no way you're hearing from the Lord. That's spiritual pride, my friend. Yeah. Word of God says you ought not think more highly of yourself than what you ought to. Yes. Word of God says that pride and a haughty spirit comes before fall. Lord, help us. Amen. And I just wanted to make that point right there. So we're trying to look at the condition. Here's another situation and then we'll move on to the regular teaching, setting the tone for what's going on in the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 18. We're talking about communion now. Paul's doing the teaching on communion. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must 
also be, therefore there must be also heresies among you. Now listen, I'm not going to dig into these words too deeply, but I want you to know divisions and heresies have something in similar. It's talking about separation and division. It's not talking about unity. Both of those words, heresies, not just what you think it means, false doctrine. It is many times connected to false doctrine, but more specifically, it's about separation and separating the body and causing division within the body. Okay. That they, that they which are approved may be, made, may, may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. He's saying, you're coming together, you're acting like you're coming to eat the Lord's Supper, but that's not really what you're doing. For in eating, everyone takes before... Let, let's go ahead and go to another literal translation. We're going to go to the NASB right here. Verse 20. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and, and, and shame those who have nothing? I want to point that out. That's a big part right there. Because I believe when we go through some scriptures, when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, I want you to see. Listen, there were varying, there's varying levels of socioeconomic status in churches. Some people have more, some people have less, right? And, and the word of the Lord does not, he's not a respecter of persons. God is not a respecter. He doesn't really care how much money you have in your bank account, especially if you're hoarding it. <laughs> he's not. And now if you're giving it, hallelujah. But if you're hoarding it, he's not really that concerned about how much money you have in your bank account. Okay, the Lord is concerned about all of us Walking in unity and our heart and our life being made one in Christ that we can work together as his body so that he can get more accomplished out of us to do the will of the Lord. Y'all doing okay tonight? Oh, yeah. yes. Hallelujah. Praise God. Some people are with me. Some people I lose. Why do I lose people so quick? I try. Lord Jesus, help the people. Help the people to hear your word when it goes yeah, forth. Right. That it would be that it would do its work in their heart and in their lives. Yeah. That your word would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish what you called it forth to do. Yeah. Because I can promise you this word is for each and every one of us in this place. Yes. Hallelujah. So I'm trying to set the stage here. So last time we talked about the Holy Spirit in prayer. And where we ended was that sometimes we don't even know what we should pray for and that the Holy Spirit will pray through us and he will he will make utterances. Right. And we talked about the fact that that's not really talking about praying in tongues, but it's really like a groaning. You see how it says that? Likewise, the spirit helps us in our infirmities when we're weak, for we know not what we should pray as we ought to. But the spirit itself, the spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever, and I don't mean to belabor this point because I want to move forward to prophetic tongues. I don't know if you've ever, you know, there's different levels to prayer. You, and I mean, I think many of you probably do understand that, I hope. And what I mean by that is, and I'm not saying that God doesn't hear prayers that are in the outer court. I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying. And everybody's, everybody may pray differently, right? Like some people may get loud. Some people may be quiet. But, you know, that is one thing that I will say, too, is that if people don't pray the way, the way that you want to pray, okay, or it's not like creating an atmosphere that you want created, you know, uh, like, you know, Nye and I were talking the other day. It seems like sometimes, and I, I'm kind of doing a little rabbit trail here, but I've noticed something else like too, when we come and pray and I'm not picking on anybody because I've seen it in my own life, but it's like sometimes people want to hurry up and connect their music to the box when we come in here to pray because because people like their own music because that's their preference. And I get that. No, 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 no. I'm not calling anybody out because I feel it sometimes <laughs> in my own self, but I don't like it when I feel it. Okay, because I'm supposed to learn by the Holy Spirit to prefer my brother over myself, right? I didn't get to the point where I don't care. You know what? Just put your music on. Because I, I want to learn how to work, whether we have music or don't have music. I learned this lesson a long time ago. When I left Cornerstone and went to Franklin, I didn't like their music at first. And you know what the Lord said? Get on your knees. Get on your knees and worship me. What, what are you doing? You're going to let some kind of music get in the way of you worshiping me? No. And then, and then I don't mean to look, you know what? 
I've been thinking a long time about this. Ever since the Lord got a hold of me, I like to pray with the lights dim. There was a, man, there was a person that I respect a lot one time that made a comment. And he said, they said this. You know, so-and-so said, so it was, a, it was a coming from another person. So-and-so said, God is light, the enemy is dark, and so why would we want to be in the dark? And so we want the lights on. All right, well, listen, this is what I want to say about that. Men have opinions. That's right. I was thinking about this the other night after Nye and I had this conversation. It, th what I'm about to say doesn't make me right. Let me, let me clear, clarify that. What I'm about to say right now doesn't make me right. But I'm about to say what I'm about to say. After Naya, because you know, sometimes people want to pray within the light. Sometimes people like the lights dim. Sometimes people like this kind of music. Sometimes people like that kind of music. The first time I came here to pray corporate prayer, I'm just going to be real. I've said it to Brother Kirk before. He'll probably watch the video. I didn't like his music. I couldn't get in. I went and hid up in that closet right there on that dirty carpet in there, trying to get along with the Lord. The Lord said, what are you doing? Get out of here. You got all the time in the world to spend time in the presence of the Lord by yourself, and you can do it any old way you want to, but corporate prayer is also important. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Okay, and so you know what I did after Naya said that about the light thing? I started thinking, well, hold on a second. God created the day and the night. That's right. That's right. During the day, he, he made a greater light to rule the day, and he made a lesser light to rule the night. And during the day, something beautiful happens to the physiology of your body. Because when the sun hits your body, guess what? You produce vitamin D. And another beautiful thing happens at nighttime. Because at nighttime, guess what happens? Your body releases melatonin. And number one, we're talking about a spiritual thing. We're not even talking about a physical thing. And then, oh yeah, but that's what they did. They slept the night. Hold on. Jesus, the word of God says in Mark 1 and 35, long before the break of day, he got alone in a solitary place. And there he Pray. Let me say one more thing. You think they had electricity during the time of Jesus? No. They were praying and seeking the face of God with an oil lamp. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. And then now I'm about to shut it down. But I took a little rabbit trail the other night. You might want to do some research on your boys. Who's, who's your boys? The one that discovered electricity. Y'all remember him? Y'all learned about him in elementary school. I ain't gonna even say his name. Even though that brother's sitting here, well, I don't think he was my brother. Even though he's sleeping in the grave, I'm not gonna say his name. But you might want to do some research on what he was tapping into. Uh -huh. Then the one that learned how to harness electricity and put it into what we call lights, to, you might want to do a little research to see what he was tapping. So now with that said, don't tell me that fluorescent lights are either of God or they're of the devil because I'm not buying it. Don't tell me that lighting in a sanctuary makes a difference. Now, I don't want to be it so dark because, look, I'm going I'm to call you out. And Ms. Matilda said, what's the deal with the lights? I said, I'm sorry. She said, brother, I just can't see. I'm scared. I'm going to trip over myself. So you know what? When she said that, I said, well, maybe it was too dark. Maybe it was too dark. So you know what it did? I put a lamp back there. Why? Because I ain't trying to mess my sister up. I'm trying to make everybody happy as much as I can. But this is the main point I wanted to make. It's, we got to be careful about division. And we got to be careful that we don't start thinking that we so spiritual that we got the answers. And I'm not even saying you're doing that. I'm telling you that kind of thing has happened to me before. That I think that I got all the answers and that you can't be hearing from the Lord because I'm right and you're wrong. No. Come on now. All right. I did it. I went there. All right. The Holy Spirit, though, will help you when you need help. Amen. And if you've never tapped into that. To that place where in the Holy of Holies. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. When you've been in there and you've been praying and you make a connection, it's almost like you grab the hold of the hem of his garment. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. If you ain't never been there, you might want to try that. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's a beautiful place to be. Because when you're hurting and the Spirit of God starts groaning through you, amen, it's, a, it's an awesome thing. Because your situation might not have changed. But the Holy Spirit's peace that surpasses understanding begins to minister to your heart, to your mind. Amen. Yeah. And it's an awesome thing. All right. So now we're going to talk about worshiping and praising in the spirit. This is scripture here. First Corinthians 14, 15. What is it then? 
I will pray with the spirit. He means I will pray in my tongue. I will pray with the understanding also. So he'll pray with his tongue. He'll pray with his natural language. He says, I will sing with the spirit and I will sing in my natural tongue. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing whenever the people of God have the freedom to worship the Lord yes. the way they desire to worship the Lord. Some people are going to worship the Lord a little louder. Some people are going to worship the Lord a little bit lower. At times, some people want to sing in tongues. At other times, they might want to sing in their natural language. Yes. It's a beautiful thing when people have freedom to worship the Lord. Amen. Now, let's talk a little bit about prophesying in tongues. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 18 through 19. And so we're talking about now the difference between praying or worshiping in tongues versus speaking in tongues out loud for the purpose to give a word to the church. You understand what I'm saying? Some Pentecostal or charismatic believers don't even, and I don't mean to be ugly, they don't even know the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and their prayer language versus giving a word out loud in the church in tongues. When we believe, well, this is what I believe. I believe that when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you now have a prayer language. I believe sometimes people hold it in. I believe sometimes people hold it in. And you're supposed to release that stuff. Come on now. Let the Holy Spirit pray through you. Let, the, let it come out. Okay. Hallelujah. Let it come out. And, and so, so I want you to know, though, that we believe. And that's your prayer language. Hallelujah. That's different than the gift of giving a word out loud in tongues. So far, the one person, I believe there's more. There's more in this place. But so far, the one person we have is Sabrina. She has the gift of giving a word in tongues. And she has the gift of of interpreting the tongue. Amen. So this is what he says. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. Right there. He's talking about his prayer language. I speak with tongues. Or he could be also talking about giving a word. Okay. But, the, but if he's given a word, he's given an interpretation. But he says, I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. The apostle Paul is probably constantly praying in tongues. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Praying in tongues. Praying in tongues. Praying in the spirit. But look what he says. Yet in the church... I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also. I want you to see this. A common thread in most of these scriptures is about the body of Christ, about other people being taught, about other people being edified or built up because the Holy Spirit wants his body parts, his members to be built up to be strengthened, to be equipped so that they can go outside the walls of this church. Come on, somebody. I don't know what the preacher across the street. I didn't mean that like that. I don't know what the preacher somewhere else in this neighborhood or somewhere else around here is preaching. I just know what the word of God says. The word of God says this. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us up and he wants to take us outside and he wants to bring us into. That's the book of Acts, my friend, where people are praying for other people on the outside, where people are witnessing on the outside, where people are evangelizing on the outside. And it's not just the preacher. I prayed it in the prayer room but listen even though even Moses said for me you envy thou for me Joshua no I would that all God's people be filled with the Holy Spirit and that they all prophesy God wants all of his people to be filled with the Holy Ghost and to prophesy and to speak forth the truth of God so he says this in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now, listen, you got to be careful that you don't assume that he means what well, you see there. He doesn't want to speak it in tongues in the church. Unless, no, no, no. He didn't. He's not saying you can't sing in tongues. He's not saying you can't pray in tongues. He, he's right there. He's talking about a word in tongues. OK, does that make sense? All right. This is kind of like a rhetorical question because I'm one of these guys that maybe it gets me in trouble, but I think, all right, so what does it say? I'm going to read it to you because it's kind of small. It says, is tongue the language question mark? I know y'all, I know y'all got some, your opinions. Okay. And I, I respect your opinions. I respect a lot of people's opinions because I don't know that I got the answer to this, but I sure have thought about it a lot. Is tongues a language? <clears throat> is tongues of men or angels? Can the devil understand 
when we pray in tongues. Y'all have all heard various things about that, right? The devil can't understand when we pray in tongues. So let's just talk about this a little bit more. And I'm just trying to introduce some thought in your mind. It's something for you to think about and pray about. It doesn't make me right. Because I'm going to be honest with you. Nobody can prove it either way. I don't think you can. If you give me some scripture, we'll talk about it. Okay, but look what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. 1. Why did you even bring up angels, preacher? Because Paul did. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity or love, I have become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Are you saying tongues is a language of angels? That's not what I'm saying. I don't, that, I don't even understand why that would be. Why would God want me to speak in an angelic tongue? I don't, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying Paul mentioned that and it's kind of interesting. Why did you mention that? All right. What I want to talk a little bit about is the language of men. A lot of Pentecostal preachers, a lot of Pentecostal commentators believe that when you speak in tongues, you speak in some human form of language. Now, I had the pleasure, and you, this isn't going to mean anything to you, but to people that are in academia, in Pentecostal circles, it means something, okay? I was able to sit under the teaching of Dr. Stanley Horton, who wrote one of, some of the first books on Pentecostal doctrine. He was 90 years old whenever I went and saw him in person. Me and, brother, me and Pastor Brad flew to Dallas, and we sat in a class. And he had a, a doctorate from Harvard. Now, that may not be like a big deal. A lot of people talk about, oh, you know, they came out of the, instead of the seminary, the cemetery. Okay, but let me just say this. It's kind of a big deal when you have somebody that can read the original languages and is also Pentecostal. You don't find that a lot. Nevertheless, his position was that tongues came from a human language. I thought this was interesting. He said that there's over 11,000 current human dialects in the world today. Then he said, and I could be statistically wrong on this, but I think the number was anywhere from three to 5,000 human dialects that had already been lost, that, that, that we just don't even know anymore, okay? So with that said, that's, I feel like that's interesting, right? Um, now, I thought about this. What about spirit to spirit? See, because the Holy Spirit lives in me. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. Let's go ahead and go to that real quick. I'm going to just share this with you. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. It says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. You see, when you pray in your heavenly language, you don't really know what you're praying. And one of the points that I'm trying to make is whenever I put this like this, I put a question mark. I said, is it spirit to spirit? I capitalized one spirit. It's hard for you to see. I made the other one lowercase because what I'm trying to say is this. If the Holy Spirit in me utters groanings, is it possible that whenever I'm praying in tongues, it's actually the language of the Holy Spirit, but me working with him and yielding with him, me joint participating with him. Can I prove it? No. I'm just, but they can't prove it's a human language either. Oh, but what about in the book of Acts? They heard that could have been the miracle of them hearing somebody from another language. If you had all of these different people from different languages, uh, different nations, they, and many people believe that the miracle was really more in the reception of the hearing than it was in the speaking, that they were not necessarily all, they heard them speak in their native language. Okay, but anyway, so but what is my point? My point is this, is that, could tongues be spirit to spirit? And then I wanted to say this. Does it really matter? Can the devil, can the devil understand what we're praying when we pray in tongues? I don't know. But let me say this. Is there a human language? Is there a human language he doesn't know? If, do, let me ask you this. Okay, y'all mind doing this with me? If you believe it's a human language when you pray in tongues, raise your hand. I know some of y'all ain't raising your hand and y'all believe it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, because there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just our opinion. Okay, but this is what I'm trying to say. If we believe it's a human language, you tell me one human language that the devil don't know. That's right. But this is my point. Why does it matter? Yes. Like, I'm not trying to be funny, but one time I did this Google Translate and I spoke in tongues and it, and it took a while but he came up with 
Because I was thinking, well, maybe if it's a language, it can translate. What yeah. It but Siri may not know the 5,000 that we're lost, sis. Okay. Yes, ma'am. There's been a couple of times I was sitting in a service, and there was a, somebody that was, that was speaking in tongues, and somebody literally said, listen, I'm from such and such a place. And right. Yeah. Amen. And I, I believe that could be true. But it doesn't necessarily mean, like, like in other words, that they were speaking in that language. Well, let me just say this. I've heard that story before, huh? I've heard that too. Oh, she said that she's been in services before where people were speaking in tongues and somebody else said that that was the language of a nation that they were from. And I've heard other people say that, but then other people said, but it didn't sound like it was Spanish. It didn't sound like whatever, but that's what they heard in their tongue, in their ear. So what I'm trying to say is, again, still the miracle could be at the reception of it. But the point is this. It doesn't really matter whether the devil can understand it or not because he can't stop it is the point. I don't care what he hears. I don't care what he knows. I'm praying in the spirit and I'm believing God's giving me power and that he's, he's building up my whole, most holy faith. I'm just trying to say, listen, this is a big deal. People say this a lot. But anyway, who knows? All right, we're going to move on. Yes. Yeah, amen. The spirit. I believe that. I believe it could be the very well the spirit moving with my spirit. Again, yes. Just interject one more thing. I believe that when we speak in tongues, that we are speaking the perfect will of God. Praise God. There's no way to be I believe that. He can't stop it. That's the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is whether he understands it or not. I, I, that doesn't matter to me. I know he can't stop it. Amen. He can't stop the perfect will of God. That's the point I was trying to make. Is that cool? I'm glad we got that point across. Thank you. So the gifts of the spirit. Okay. Multiple gifts. Multiple members. One spirit. Right? And so I want you to know that. So these are the gifts of the spirit. That's one of the points I'm trying to make. These are the spirit's gifts. Right? So, and, and the Holy Spirit distributes his gifts as he sees fit. So to another, he distributes the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirit. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these work that one in the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. It's a beautiful thing when we can see the body of Christ. It's a big deal. God wants his gifts to flow in, this, in the services. The reason that I'm talking about these things is because I believe with all of my heart, the Holy Spirit wants to start moving more and more in our services. I believe with all of my heart, he wants the gifts of the Spirit to start to become manifest. I believe he wants more words in tongues, more interpretation in tongues. I believe he wants more prophetic utterances. I believe he wants more words of wisdom, more words of knowledge. I believe he wants to gift you with discerning of spirits. I believe that the, he wants more faith. He wants more miracles. I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to move in our church. You know why I believe that? Because I believe that the Holy Spirit spanked me and told me to get out of the way so that he could do that very thing. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to move in you. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to fill you up. He wants to gift you and he wants to release your gift. Why? So that the body of Christ can be built up and to be edified. I believe that. But it's his gift. And he distributes it as he sees fit. And sometimes whenever people start to operate in gifts, I've noticed that they can start to get a little puffed up. And we want to be careful about that. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Many membered body and he wants to use his body. Amen. So this is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. For as the body is one and has many members... And all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. I think that's important for us to stop for a second. Because if we go back to the book of Acts, and we find that the common denominator for the book of Acts was what? Unity of spirit. One mind, one accord. The members of the body of Christ. Multiple members, but all cohesively have one thing in common. They want to glorify the king of kings. And the Lord of the Lord. You know, we are so diverse. We have such different personalities in this place, right? I mean, let's be real. Thank God that we're different. We look different. We act different, right? But there's something that happens when we yield our spirit to the Holy Spirit that he starts to do a work in us and that the spirit of Christ comes alive in us and that we gain the desire to minister to those that are hurting. That's really what the Lord wants to do in us. 
Does that make sense? I'm not, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about what other churches do tonight. I, I want. There's a part to me that wants to point it out because I've been in them. It doesn't mean that they're all doing that. And I've been praying for for other. And I don't know what each church does because I don't go to them. But I've been in enough other churches to know that their heart is not always connected to what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I've been to churches before where I believe it was a good preacher and he was preaching on personal evangelism and he even was uncomfortable preaching it because he knew that the people were going to start squirming in their chairs and they started to squirm. He said, I know it's uncomfortable, but I feel like this is what the Lord wanted me to tell you. And you can feel it. People were getting nervous. People, but the, the crazy thing is, is that ain't nobody asking you to do nothing in your flesh. Amen. The holy, it's got to be the, a move of the spirit. And when he fills us up, y'all know. Look, okay, I'm going to do this thing again. We did this a while back. Raise your hand, please. Just work with me. Raise your hand if over the last two weeks you shared Jesus with somebody. Come on. See that? Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, Corey. Raise your hand. Come on. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's what I'm trying to talk about. You shared your faith with somebody. Some of y'all might even have laid hands on people. Come on now. Now we're taking it to another level. Laying hands on people. Okay, well, no, I don't want to make anybody feel weird. Some of y'all done laid hands on somebody at Walmart in the last two weeks and believe God. Come on, girl. Believe God for a healing. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about. That's the book of Acts. That we're going to believe God and he's going to heal on the outside of these walls. That he's going to pour his spirit into somebody. That somebody's going to wake up. Hallelujah. That they're going to come alive. So there were many members and we're one body and Christ. So for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we're Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free. Now I want to point that out. I underline that because you remember whenever we talked about people that had, that didn't have anything that by the time they made it to the communion service, everything was gone. So I want you to know that this church was made up of both masters and slaves. No, really, bond or free. You think the Apostle Paul's just throwing that in there for good measure? No, this is what's going on in the church. Slavery was a common thing in the Roman Empire. It doesn't mean that God was okay with it. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote, that's another story, but the whole letter to Philemon is about that, about a slave named Onesimus. But this is the thing, bond or free. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is, see, whether they're bond or free, whether they're Jew or Gentile, they've all been made to be one of the body. And they're all, even though they're an individual member, it's all about the body of Christ. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. God is not about caring about how much money, what kind of car somebody drives. Help us, Lord. It doesn't, listen, somebody might not dress like you. They might not talk like you. But if they genuinely love the Lord, hallelujah, God loves them and he wants to use them. And we need to learn how to die to self so that we can love our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Yes, yes. And expect that they too will be used. Amen. Yes. Love is the principal thing. See, it's interesting to me that 1 Corinthians 12 is here. 1 Corinthians 14 is here, and right there sandwiched in the middle is the love chapter. No. Love does not vaunt itself. Love is not puffed up. I don't have time to go to the words, but if you started clicking on that, some of them words mean like a blowfish, to be blowed up. To be like, they want to be, people want to be exalted. And y'all know what I'm talking about because every last one of us wants to sometimes be recognized. Lord, help us. Help us. Because anytime we're over here looking for recognition, guess what? We're probably taking the shine off of Jesus. Help us. All right. So the well-being of the saints. Prophecy, too. I wanted to mention that there's something different between, because look what it says. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that you may prophesy. Why? Why prophesy over just speaking in tongues? Because when you speak in tongues without an interpretation, it doesn't do anybody any good. And we'll get into one of those scriptures in a moment. But when you prophesy, now we're not just talking about a word of knowledge here. That is a prophetic utterance, but it's usually to an individual. But when you prophesy out loud, 
you're actually edifying the whole church because a word of God, a prophetic utterance is going forth to encourage the people of God. And I will tell you this, that when a word of tongues goes forth, followed by an interpretation, the two form a prophetic utterance, right? But the whole thing is all about charity, about love. Why? Equipping and edification of the body of Christ to equip and to build up the saints of God so that they can do the work of the ministry. Amen? Amen. He, Paul wants everybody to speak in tongues, but prophecy edifies the whole church. A word of tongues followed by an interpretation also becomes prophecy. Look what he says, 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I would that you all spoke with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interprets that the church may receive edifying. So it's all about the church being edified or built up. He's saying that if I come, this one here, he's saying if I come speaking in tongues without interpretation, I'm not doing you any good. He says, now brethren, 1 Corinthians 14, 6, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? In other words, Whenever someone comes and they bring teaching, instruction, they bring the truth of God's word. If you care, if I care, then it builds us up and we learn a little bit more about the will of God. We learn a little bit more about how God operates. Amen. And if we're willing to receive that truth, it's going to get on the inside of us and it's going to begin to change us. So this I wanted to make this point here. Tongues in church without interpretation is meaningless for the body as far as a word of prophecy going forth. Worshiping and singing in tongues as the pastor of this church until y'all get rid of me. Okay, I give you the thumbs up. Let's let it happen, Captain. What I'm trying to say is let's give glory to the Lord. And if you want to sing in tongues, then you sing in tongues. And if you want to pray in tongues, now let me just, can I just preface that with something? As a matter of fact, if you want to pray loud, pray loud. Let's just remember, sometimes there is the possibility that whatever we're doing, we could take the focus off of Jesus and put it on something else. So let's just be mindful. That's all I'm trying to say. Let us be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that you can't. I want people to be able to be free to pray. I want people to be able to be free if they want to sit down to sit down. But I want to be able to be free to walk back and forth if I want to walk back and forth. I want, if Lily wants to get loud, I want Lily to get loud. If Bill wants to get up there and clap and sing, I want Bill to be able to get up here and clap and sing. Because as long as we're exalting Jesus and our desire is to equip the saints to build people. If the other ladies want to get up here under the cover and just worship the, I want everybody to be able to worship the king because he alone is worthy. And I want us all to be able to be in unity of the spirit yes. so that we can all work together. Amen? Amen. So look at this. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you are mad? Now I want to bring a little bit of clarity to this real quick. I put, they might think you're crazy up in my little notes. I said, good. And I don't mean to be rude. Go find a Baptist or a Presbyterian church because we're Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. I'm talking now. Listen, I'm going to make a clarification right here. I'm not talking about when we're praying and singing in tongues. And that's another thing. To, okay, let me not get into that. But when we're praying and singing in tongues, what I'm saying is if we're praying and singing in tongues and some guy comes in and he says, these people are crazy. They're singing in tongues. He might be an unbeliever. I do not want to be seeker sensitive, my friend. I want to be spirit sensitive. And I believe that a person that's hungry that comes into the place and where Jesus is being magnified and the Holy Spirit is moving, that their spirit will be drawn to the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, with that said, this is I did this little this little illustration the last time I taught on this. And I want to try to do it again. Bill, do you remember what you said that night? Yes. Okay. Did anybody else speak that night? Who else spoke? Lily, you had a word. You had a, Naya had a word. Okay, who else? Uh, yep, Mike, you had a little word. Okay, uh, Rich, you want to have a word? I'm laughing at her word. Okay, you're laughing at her word. Yvette, you want a word? Say something. You remember what that little illustration? You got a word you can say? South of the border? 
Just clown. Whatever you want to do. So this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to point to each one. Now you got to remember this is a trick because this is what I believe was going on in Corinth. Now just imagine, they're going to say English words, but just imagine this was all different people speaking in other tongues. Okay. And whenever I point to you, you'll say your word. And then when the next person starts talking, you won't stop. You keep saying your word. All right. Because I believe this is the context of what we were dealing with in Corinth. Personally, this is what I believe. Bill? Red sky at night, sailor delight. Red Lord sky Jesus. morning, sailor Lord morning. Jesus. Red sky at night, sailor delight. Red sky at morning, sailor Jesus. morning. Red sky at night, sailor delight. Red sky at morning, sailor morning. Hallelujah! 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 All right. Okay, good. I made the point. Yeah. The point that I'm trying now imagine. See, I didn't want to get y'all to pray in fake tongues because I think that's irreverent. Yeah. But, but I wanted to make a point that everybody is saying something all at once. I'm telling you, we're about to get into a couple of verses real quick, that it's showing you that that's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. And this is where you get spiritually puffed up. It's kind of like, oh, you got a word? What? I'm more spiritual, so I got to give you my word. Okay? And so they're, they're cutting in on each other. And I'm trying to tell you that that's not the will of the Lord Amen. because we're supposed to be humble and we're supposed to be yielding to the Amen. spirit Amen. and that Jesus laid his life down. Amen. So that we can have life. Hallelujah. All right. Look at this right here. First Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm. I was thinking about this, too, because look, you know, a psalm is a psalm. Now, this is a beautiful thing. If Rich has a song tonight, Micah has a song tonight, Naya has a song tonight, Danielle has a song tonight, whoever else, if Shelby was here, had a song tonight, it'd be a beautiful thing if each one of them took turns and sang their song. Would it not be ridiculous if they all tried to sing the different song at the same time? Yes. It would be absolutely ridiculous. Oh, yes. That's the point he's trying to make. He says, you have a, every one of you has a psalm. One, some of you has a doctrine. Some of you has a tongue. Some of you has a revelation. Some of you has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. In other words, everybody can't release everything all at one time. It just turns into a big cacophony. It doesn't make any sense. Now, if somebody comes in from the outside and all this is going on, it's a bunch of pandemonium. They would think we were mad and they probably would be right and they would be smart to walk out and leave. But if they walk in and people are praying and singing in tongues at the altar because they're worshiping the Lord, I'm just saying that's kind of on them. Because I'm trying to let the Holy Spirit move. You're trying to let the Holy Spirit move. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14, 27 through 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at, or at the most by three. Now think about that. Think about the, the context that we've already created. Can you imagine? One after the other after the other breaking in on each other and everybody just a bunch of pandemonium. So it's given them some instruction that, you know, to allow, to allow the course to flow properly. Let it be at the most by three that by course let and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Now, I wanted to, this is kind of like a long and I don't expect you to read it. I was going to read it, but I'm not going to because we don't have time. But this is what I wanted to say. So how are we supposed to know if there's an interpreter in the house if we never speak in the tongue? And I'm going to be honest with you. I've had people admit to me that they've suppressed the interpretation. Now, I'm not picking on anybody because, you know, people are like, well, I, got, I think I got the gift of interpretation, but I can't do it. No, you can't do it. Because if you have the gift of interpretation, it means you're baptizing the Holy Spirit. And the purpose of your baptism of the Holy Spirit is for boldness to be able to operate and function according to the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that don't, don't be fearful I mean, listen, Sabrina's already prayed to receive interpretation, but some of you may feel like you have the gift of giving a word in tongues. Don't be fearful to release that tongue because you feel like there's not an interpreter in the house. We may not know unless I'll do the due diligence of a pastor and I will get up and I will say, does anybody have an interpretation? And if nobody ever brings it, then guess what? We'll wait a period of time. We'll keep praying. And when the Holy Spirit moves upon you again, we'll believe God. Amen. Now, again, we're not going to sit here 
every single service and keep releasing a tongue whenever nobody's bringing an interpretation because we have the will of the Lord on this. Amen. But does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? Somebody releases the tongue. Amen. And then we believe God that there's somebody that also has the interpretation. I believe that. Yes. yes. So in other words, you're willing to allow us to learn. Absolutely. Right. I think that we have to release, yes. we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. I mean, we're, we're mature enough to be able to handle that, aren't we? To where we can, could, listen, I'm telling you there's at least three people in this place that admitted to me that they have the gift of interpretation, but that they've been re reticent to release it or apprehensive to release it. And I don't say that to beat nobody up. I say that with all love and compassion. Yes, yes. Okay, but we have to be willing to release. And one of the people's not even here tonight. So don't think that I'm just picking on you. One of the people's not even here tonight. Okay, whoever you might be. Uh, but I'm saying is, if we never release it, then we never see the gifts flowing. And then you just get to listen to me preach every night. Whenever the Holy Spirit. And let me just say this. I've said it before, but it's important that we understand that. That, that the music ministry, and I believe that they're ready. Because we've talked about it before. The music ministry has already been instructed and aware that if somebody begins to bring a word that the music needs to come down. But I, and I've said this last time, but I'm going to say it again. If you are already a loud person and you feel as though the Lord's putting a prophetic utterance in your heart, you're going to need to make it different than what you were already doing so that the music ministry knows because you can't expect them if you're always loud, if you don't change, if there's not something different about it, how are they supposed to know to bring the music down? I'm trying to talk to you about because I'm crying out that the Lord would move through the gifts of the Spirit because I am i don't want the Holy Spirit hamstrung anymore. I want the Holy Spirit to be able to flow and I want Him to be able to have His way and I believe He wants to do that. Does that make sense? Amen. Yes. So what you are saying, you gotta restrict the Holy Spirit to move in our church? Sir? We are restricting the Holy Spirit to move. We can yes, sir. We can be restricting the Holy Spirit to move if we don't let him do what he wants to do. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. 1 Corinthians 14, 30 through 32. If anything be revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace, for you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So now here you go. You got this situation right here. Miss Matilda has a word, in, a word in tongues. Okay. And then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. He's given instruction. For whatever reason, all of a sudden, Bill feels a tongue busting forth. And he, he feels like he's got to release it. Got to release this tongue. Okay. Well, the scripture says right here that Miss Matilda is supposed to bring herself down to let Bill give his word. That's what it says. For you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn. He says it up here. If anything be revealed to another one that sits by, let the first one hold his peace so that you may all prophesy one by one that you all may learn. Right. And all may be comforted. For the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Some people have said, I don't feel like I can hold it in. Well, the spirit is subject to the prophets, Amen. right? It is. That's what it says. So anyway, so hallelujah. Huh? So, okay, so if one person has a tongue and a prophecy and they're giving it, but somebody, I don't understand. Somebody I don't think that that should be happening a lot, but this would up. Again, we got to look at the, we got to look at the context. We're trying to create a context here. For this church, they were puffed up. They were bragging about old boy sleeping with his with his mother in law or whatever she was, not his mother in law, his stepmom. Step they were eating all the communion. They liked all their little favorite preachers. They were carnal, and so this kind of stuff was going on. Where Miss Matilda gives her word, and Bill's like, "Oh no, she didn't. I'm gonna give my word." And so the Apostle Paul probably telling Miss Matilda just. Just let, just, him let him. <laughs> just let him do his thing. Just let him do his thing. Go ahead. You can, you can control it. This, this one, not, not Bill, Bill wouldn't really do that, but I'm just saying. So I'm trying to create the context. Now it starts to make more sense. Amen? I got one other thing. Yeah. But in 14.2, he says, For he that speaketh in tongues and understandeth all things, not into man, but into God. Unto God. For no man understands him, how be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. 
So that kind of answers the question that we, you had asked earlier. Do we think that the tongue is something that man understands or is yeah. it? So apparently it, it's not. Yeah, well, but, but I think at that point he's also talking about about in your prayer language too, but anytime a tongue goes forth without an interpretation, we do not understand it because man doesn't understand it unless an interpretation or like she said, somebody in the crowd ha has given the gift by the Holy Spirit to understand what's being spoken. So that's not necessarily our prayer language that we're speaking just yeah, I, well, I well, I do well, I do believe that it's also our prayer language. Whenever you and I pray in tongues, we don't understand what right. we're saying. Okay. It might flow after we've prayed in English, so it might be following, and it might be of the same vein, maybe. Right. But we don't know that with certainty. Does that make sense? This has been a long teach, and I appreciate y'all's. Uh, all right, I'm gonna close out with this. Let your women. Why don't the why don't the music ministry come forward? Let your women keep silence in the churches. And somebody sent me a. Uh, I already had this in there before you said. Somebody sent me a video where this dude was going off on TikTok about this. But let your women. And I don't believe this. Let us understand that we have women preachers in this church. Let your, so what I'm saying is, when I say I don't believe it, it's not that I don't believe the word of God. I believe that there's something here that we're not understanding. Just like we didn't understand the context of the church before. Maybe we understand the context a little bit better after the teaching. But so it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So what I want to do is I want to real quick, I want to try to create a little bit of a context for this. You got to understand that this pagan world was different. I've already told you that there were two ports in the city of Corinth. I told you there were temple prostitutes. But even more than that, most of these temple prostitutes were known as oracles. Mm -hmm. What is an oracle? Like the woman with the spirit of divination. Mm -hmm. She followed behind Paul, right? And she says, these men be of the Lord. She, was, she had a spirit of divination. She was like Sister Chloe used to be on TV, right? Through demonic spirits, she was given information to release words from demonic spirits. People would go there, kind of like people go to get their cards read. People go to get words that, from necromancers. That's what the book of Leviticus told them. Don't, don't speak with the necromancers. This was prevalent. This was prevalent in this area. So you have these women that are filled with demonic spirits that are giving words. And now some of them are probably getting saved. But in addition to that, they've seen some of this stuff going on in, in the city. And so people are probably out of control. The whole church seems to have been out of control. And the Apostle Paul says it here and he also says it in Timothy. And it's interconnected, I believe, with the plaiting of the hair that we're seeing all of that stuff. Like Peter wrote about in his letter. That let your beauty be adorned not outwardly, but let it be inwardly. And I believe that what was happening is, is that some of these women were usurping and taking authority. We don't even know. He doesn't say it. But what about the spirit of Jezebel trying to usurp the authority of leadership and trying like these kinds of things happening? And this is the point that I want to make. And then we're going to close. We're going to worship. All right. But you can't tell me that women aren't called to speak for God That's right. or to operate in the gifts. You can't do it. Why? How you say? How can you say that, uh, Pastor? But Peter, Acts 2, 14 and 15, Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, said unto me, unto them, ye men of Judea, and all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last day, says God. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Yes. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. I just say a couple more things before I close. Deborah was a prophetess in the book of Judges. She was an oracle for God. She was a mouthpiece for God. She spoke the word of God. Phoebe, I can't get away from this. Phoebe, you know who Paul gave the letter to the Romans to? The letter to the Romans. He gave it to Phoebe and he put her in a boat and he said, deliver it, sis. He trusted her with the most powerful letter. If we didn't have the book of Romans, we wouldn't even understand justification by faith. We wouldn't understand the sinful nature. We wouldn't understand the power of what Jesus did at the cross in the spiritual realm. 
called and trusted Phoebe with that. And there's evidences within the word of God that she was a leader in the church. So my point is, is this, is that no, God has called us and you are free. Amen. Women of the crossway, you are free to be used by God. Not that you need my permission because the Holy Spirit's giving you permission, but you are free to be used by God. Hallelujah. You're free. We're all free to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Let's just make sure whatever we're doing is exalting Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. We're about to worship the Lord.